Welcome to the Beck Lab here at Wichita State University, where you get to see clearly unqualified people successfully perform protocols that you thought were difficult, thus giving you the confidence to do them yourselves. Remember, what one fool can do, another can. We're going to be doing meiotic chromosome counts. We're talking about them today. Uh, this is an old technique. People have been using the, the particular type of count that we're going to be doing. People have been doing that since the 1920s. I myself was taught really everything I know about these counts from uh, Mike Windham, who in turn was taught by Florence Wagner. So this is the kind of classic technique that gets handed down through generations of botanists. Specifically, what we want to do is catch cells that are, that are going through meiosis. Really, meiosis 1 is what we really want. And in plants, of course, the best way to do that is to look in immature anthers where you've got microsporocytes going through meiosis to produce microspores, which will then form um, the male gametophyte that we often call the pollen grain. But that meiotic series there, going from uh, microsporocyte to microspore, that's what we're trying to catch. And of course, in an immature anther, you've got, um, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands of cells that might be going through that at a particular time. So you've decided to do a meiotic chromosome count. That's great. The next thing you need to do is go out and fix some immature floral material for this count. So use digitized herbarium data, something like that, to figure out where, at what time of year that species in your area is going to have um, immature buds, will be in maybe early flower or even just before that. We want, we want immature buds because uh, we're again trying to look at microsporogenesis. We're looking at meiosis during microsporogenesis. Pollen, um, which comes after that, the formation of pollen, is kind of the end stage of that. So pollen is kind of the back bookend of what we're trying to look at. We want to be well before pollen. So immature floral material. Um, in fact, if we look at this fixed vial of goldenrod material, you can see that those little buds, they're kind of small little pearl-like buds. A lot of the stuff in there was actually probably even a little too late. Um, we're talking about really, really early bud material. Here's some black cherry inflorescences. You can see, really, we're talking about really, really, really immature stuff. It's a common mistake. People sample stuff that's far too far along. So, to find a population. You want to work. You, you want to work in it. There's a lot of immature floral material there. First, you make up your fixative. We fix this stuff in something called farmer's fixative, which is a mixture of glacial acetic ethanol. <laughs> glacial acetic acid, and ethanol. If you want to be really scientific about it, you bring your um, uh, cylinder out in the field and make it up in exactly the right ratio, even though it's not that critical. You want to make this stuff fresh every day. Normally what I'll do is I'll make up a couple of vials of this and throw them in my pack in case I encounter a population that, that I want to fix. Um, make this stuff up in these scintillation vials. Uh, these scintillation vials are, you know, you can buy them from really any vendor. Um, you want to get the ones that have this little plastic or rubber conical cap insert in the cap there. That'll help them seal really well. You don't want to get these that have the um, full flat foil caps inside. Those don't seal as well. <clears throat> so you've got your vial of fixative. You go to the population. You want to sample across a range of sizes of immature buds, all the way from stuff that you can barely, you know, kind of a floral primordium, all the way to something that is maybe approaching opening, but certainly not open. You want to sample across that, um, that spectrum a lot, particularly early when you're trying to identify exactly what size of buds and size of immature flowers in them is going to give you the right stage of meiosis. Um, and to do that, to, to sample that well, you're probably going to have to sample from a, multiple individuals, unless you're dealing with um, large organisms like trees, for instance. What you want to do then, because you're kind of forced to sample from multiple individuals, you want to sample from individuals that are really, really, really close to one another, that are perhaps um, clones of one another or are likely to be extremely closely related. If there is cytotype variation in that population and you sample across it, if you do sample multiple cytotypes, you're, all to, you're almost assuredly going to see that variation on the slide later. You'll see cells that clearly show, for instance, diploid and tetraploid, and you'll be alerted to the fact 
that you you kind of have a mixed sample there. Um, but that's something that we that we rarely see. From one of those individuals that you sampled from, ideally the individual you sampled m mainly from, you want to take a voucher specimen, a standard voucher specimen like we always do as good uh, plant systematists. Um, the cool thing about that specimen is then you you know that that scintillation valve with your material in it that car that you know carries your um, collection number, which by the way should also be written on a piece of paper and pencil and slipped in there in case the top becomes disassociated from the vial. That vial of fixed material, that voucher specimen, and your data and silica dried uh, leaf tissue that you've taken from it, of course, is all connected. DNA, cytotype, morphology, space, time, ecology, all that stuff, which is one of the, you know, it's what makes contemporary um, molecular systematics so powerful, the linkage between all of those things. So you fixed that plant, taking all the data you need from it. Now you're back in the lab. Um, well, not exactly. You, let's say you fix this um, in the morning or whatever, in this farmer's fixative that we showed you the recipe for. It needs to sit in that fixative for about 24 hours. It's not, um, you know, it's not the biggest deal in the world if you're slightly more or less than 24 hours, but more or less a day later, you want to dump that out and replace it with 70% ethanol. And then once it's 70% ethanol, those cells, whatever stage they were fixed at when you dumped them in that fixative, will sit there um, for perpetuity. They'll certainly be fine at room temperature until you get back from your field trip. But once you're back, you throw those babies in the minus 20, they'll, they'll be fine, you know, certainly longer than you or I are alive and you can count them uh, later at your leisure. So 24 hours in farmer's fixative, um, and then switch the fixative out with 70% ethanol, then you're good to go. Once you're back in the lab and you need to, you're thinking about gathering up all the materials to do the count, of course you need a standard um, uh, traditional dissecting scope. This one goes up to 30, 30x, that's certainly sufficient. Having a nice one with a boom type that you often see in a herbarium is, is uh, really convenient. You're going to need, you know, little ethanol and chem wipes just to kind of clean things up from time to time. You're going to need a little glass petri dish to work in. You're going to need some sharp, uh, you need a sharp pair of forceps. You might need to buy a new pair of forceps if yours have been dropped by you or a student a number of times and they kind of bent. And definitely need some sharp probes. You can just take regular probes from wherever you can find them and sharpen them up. Get a Dremel tool, get a whetstone, sharpen them up as sharp as you can possibly get them. Um, I personally like to go out and just sharpen them on the sidewalk. You can just drag them all across the sidewalk and kind of rotate them, sharpen them up really well. This is a lot of fun to do when classes are changing because then you can glare at uh, your students as they come in and out of the building as you sharpen these probes on the sidewalk. You, of course, need a microscope slide. These preps are done on slides. These are just, you know, uh, regular old slides. There's probably thousands of them hanging around your, de your department. And finally, you're going to need some cover glass, cover slips. We use cover slips that are slightly larger than ones that are most commonly used in teaching labs anyway. These are 22 by 30 millimeters. Um, it's kind of hard to see there. It's a contrast. Yeah, so they're a little bit uh, longer than tall. I guess they're rectangles instead of squares. 22 by 30 millimeters. Those are the ones that you want. And as far as the prep, those materials and a couple and a stain and another solution that we're going to talk about here in a second are really all you need. So as you can see, that's not expensive to gather that stuff if you don't already have it in your lab or department. Okay, there's two solutions that you'll need to do these preps. The first is the stain. Um, acetocarmine is uh, this red dye, carmine, which we actually get, I think, uh, from scale insects, which is pretty cool. So it's a natural dye. It's some of this, uh, it's a solution of this in um, kind of dilute acetic acid. I think it's. So that's the actual stain. So you have a concentrated um, version of that stain that you'll work with. I also make, uh, there's another portion of the prep where you want a dilute um, solution of that stain. So usually what I do is I'll cut the concentrated stain like 50-50 
with um, glacial acetic acid and so make a dilute version of stain. Um, the second <clears throat> component you need is called Hoyer's solution. And Hoyer's is, is a little trickier. Uh, we'll post the recipe for Hoyer's. Uh, the problem is Hoyer's contains uh, a compound called chloral hydrate, which interestingly, if you read up on chloral hydrate, is the component that, that people used to use to, quote, slip someone a Mickey or to make a Mickey fin, as it was often called in old movies. In other words, if you wanted to knock somebody out, you would you would put a drop of chloral hydrate in their drink, it's water, alcohol soluble, and it's a powerful incapacitant. I don't know exactly how it works in the body. <laughs> Suffice to say, chloral hydrate is, is, I think, a controlled substance and a little difficult to get your hands on. I think you can probably, if you dig around, you can probably buy Hoyer's solution itself, pre-made, perhaps from some vendors. It may be something that is around your department if you can find it. Um, and then if you get super desperate, you could probably uh, buy, buy chloral hydrate itself, use the recipe we're going to post, and make some Hoyer's on your own. Once you've either made or gotten your hands on some Hoyer's, you've made your concentrated and dilute acetylcarmine stain, and you've assembled all the other things that we talked about, you are ready to do a meiotic uh, chromosome squash, which you can then put under a microscope and look for cells that you can count. So in the next uh, part of this video, in part two, we are going to go under the dissecting scope and do the squash itself. Uh, and I hope you'll join me for that.